lot of requests nowadays about uh, people who are not beekeepers, but you know, they all hear about honeybee decline, and they want to know, so what? And what's the big deal? And that's a legitimate question. It, it really is a legitimate question. So I have been doing some uh, work trying to get a handle on this. I mean, why does honeybee decline really matter uh, to the ordinary person? And um, it, 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 we all, we've all heard the figures about uh, every third bite of food you eat, you know, when you can find a honeybee. And that's, that's basically true. That's basically true, but it's also a figure that's dated from about 1976 is when it first entered the literature. And there's been a lot of work done since 1976 on trying to resolve that uh, question a little better. It's true, but it's true for you and me. It's not necessarily true to the majority of people on planet Earth. And to understand this, you have to understand how our diets are different in this country as they are in many other parts of the world. We enjoy a large fraction of our foods that are being pollinated in Bangladesh or in poor developing countries, that fraction of their food that's bee pollinated is much smaller, a much smaller fraction. You want to turn the lights back off? So you see um, yeah. Mm -hmm. jump ahead to the particular images that are um, useful for what I was going to say. I know y'all are kind of groaning inwardly when you see, um, see. Slide number 47. You don't really want to see all the ones here. I'm going to go straight to the most boring slide on my talk. Is this one right here, because this is the new stuff. Okay, y'all are members of the Henry County Beekeepers Association. By golly, you're getting the newest information there. This is going to be published in June. Okay, so it's really new stuff. Um, what you have here, and it's worth pondering on this a little bit, okay? Graphs, right? Right. What you're seeing here are data that the authors of this paper published in Current Biology, and it's an online journal. You can look this up if you want to easy to get. And what they did was go back and analyze data from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And these, these data are, are public and available. From 1960 to the year 2006. This top left graph, graph number A, is the percentage change in the number of beehives worldwide between 1960 and the year 2006. There are three lines there. Let's start with the bottom and work our way up. The bottom line, black, is global. This is the total global sum. And you see what happened there in the late 80s? There was a global dip in the change. And then it started <coughs> inching its way back up again, but it never recovered the levels that it experienced like in the late 70s and 80s. Well, the authors of this paper said, okay, here's the global data. Bottom black line, <coughs> on number A, top left. They said, but you know, these data are really, really biased because there's two areas in the world that are really negatively weighting this entire data set. These two areas of the world, this is weird, are the United States and the former Soviet Union. In those two places, the drop in managed beehive numbers were so low that they were pulling the global data down with them. So the authors of this paper said, well, okay, let's remove the data from the United States. So what you're seeing, the blue line in the middle, they have now eliminated the United States data. The red line, they removed both the United States and the former Soviet data. And when you did that, the line is going up. This is really, really new, folks. I, I'm not even sure the headlines have caught up with this yet, but you all have. 
because you're in the right place at the right time. The global, so-called global B decline is not global. It's a uniquely American and Eastern European Russian problem. Now the, um, the authors of this paper said, well, okay, let's look for reasons <coughs> here. And they, they concluded that the problem in the former Soviet areas can be explained by a general dissolution of um, thanks. Okay. They concluded that the, the explanation for the Soviet data was just a general uh, collapse in economic hardship following the, the collapse of their governmental system. The problems in the United States, uh, they ascribe, they really didn't ascribe. They're kind of timid to say it. But what is unique about American beekeeping that is peculiar to the United States and not really practiced to any degree in any other part of the country like it is here? And that's migratory beekeeping. Migratory beekeeping. It makes sense when you think a little bit about it. Uh, the honeybee, the honeybee that you and I know and love and manage, is essentially a sedentary organism. It's housed in a peculiar place in time. It lives here, kind of like a tree. In fact, trees are their native nesting site, aren't they? Hollow trees. And in that area, that space, point in space where it lives, it's active a relatively brief period of the year. It actually, we get data for this kind of stuff. Most beehives are gaining weight for only about six weeks out of the year. And the remaining 48 <laughs> weeks out of the year, <laughs> remaining 48 weeks out of the year, the, the colony is in conservation mode. Okay, they're holding on to what they gained, but they're really only active for six weeks out of the year. Well, in migratory beekeeping, you fundamentally throw that out the window. And we are now moving bees from Texas to California only, and up the coast to pollinate Oregon apples and orchard fruits, and then over to the Dakotas to make a honey crop, and then back down to Texas for over winter, that kind of thing. So you get bees that are active eight months out of the year instead of six weeks. This is very fundamental. It's a very fundamental, imagine, imagine, to, to, to help appreciate that, imagine if you were forced to go 48 hours without sleep. Okay? It's that kind of a thing. That would be pretty fundamental to you, wouldn't it? it I mean, nothing would be unaffected in your life if you were, for whatever reason, compelled to only sleep every 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Something would suffer. Well, that's the kind of thing that we are visiting upon our bees by enforcing on them a migratory habit. There is migratory beekeeping in other parts of the world. Uh, it's known in Australia, it's known in South Africa, a little bit in Europe. Um, but it's a matter of degree. There is nowhere where it is practiced to such a degree of intensity as it is in the United States. And the, uh, the tail that wags that dog is the California almond industry. California almond um, <coughs> is sort of the poster child of pollination. Uh, tremendous value crop, real easy to pollinate, and honeybees are really good at it. And the economics are such that it's a poor, perfect storm. <coughs> the California almond growers cannot get enough honeybees. And this has been a relatively modern development in American beekeeping. Curiously corresponding, you know, pretty much with this dip. Uh, incidentally, this this dip is also attributed to the arrival of parasitic mites in the late 80s, and that was pretty much a global problem. <coughs> but um, by far heavily weighted in the Soviet, the American data. The big conclusion of this paper was that globally, the decline of the honeybee is a uniquely American and former Soviet issue. This is a big flag waving. Saying, Look at me, I'm telling you something. Okay, what is unique about us that makes us so anomalous to the rest of the world trends in agriculture? Everywhere else in the world, the numbers of managed beehives are going up. 
chew on that and think about it. Okay, um, 